اشرف الانبیاء حبیب قلوبنا و شفیع ذنوبنا ابی القاسم محمد اللهم صلی علی محمد و علی محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين المذلومين لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب الغرباء يا مذلوب مكربلا السلام على من جعل الله الشفاء في تربته السلام على من الإجابة تحت قبته السلام على ساكن كربلاء فيا ليتنا ثم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي يا سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أما بعد We address Imam al-Hussein in Ziyanat al-Waritha by reciting the following phrase Ashhadu anna ka kad akamta salat wa atayta zakat wa amarta bil ma'roof wa nahayta anil munkar hatta ataka al-yaqeen نوروا مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد <coughs> You will find that after the event of Karbala each and every one of the aimma have placed great importance on the ziyara and the visitation of Sayyid al-Shuhada Every Imam has stressed the importance and then many times have commanded their Shia to perform the ziyara of Imam al Hussein, which is why if you were to look at the literature which is available within our hadith, you will find that the A'imma have commanded us to perform ziyara on almost every occasion within the Islamic calendar. Yawm al-Ashura, visit Imam al Hussein in Karbala. Yawm al-Arba'een, visit Imam al Hussein in Karbala. You will find 15th of Sha'ban, visit Imam al Hussein in Karbala. Beginning of Rajab, visit Imam al Hussein in Karbala. Wiladat Amir al Mu'minin, visit Imam al Hussein in Karbala. You will find Eid al Adha, visit Imam Hussein in Karbala. Every other Eid that there is, whether it is Mubahila or Eid al-Fitr, visit Imam al-Hussein in Karbala. 
If as if this was not enough, you find that the Imams go on to say, not only visit Imam Al Hussein on occasion, but visit Imam Al Hussein every Thursday of the year for the rest of your lives. Which is why you find that it is mustahab to perform the ziyarah of Imam Al Hussein Laylatul Jum'ah Khasatan. And you will find within our traditions that if you are not able to go to Karbala, you find that mu'mineen from all over the globe, regardless of their distance from Karbala, if they are not able to visit Imam Al Hussein with their bodies, they visit Imam Al Hussein with their souls. And hence you find the tradition of reciting Ziyarah to Lawaritha every Thursday night. For why did the Imams of Ahlul Bayt place so much importance? Why did they emphasize and stress on the importance of visiting Imam Al Hussein on every possible occasion without the, within the Islamic calendar? You find that there are a number of reasons, but two that stand out is that number one, the Ahlul Bayt wanted the Shia to revive the memory of Karbala throughout the year. They did not want the sacrifice to be a historical event which would then be buried within the pages of history. La, the Imam, through this emphasis, was taking active steps to ensure that Karbala would remain alive would be at the top of the memory of the followers of Ahlul Bayt for the Muslimin in general, for humanity in general, until the day of judgment. This is number one in regards to preserving and ensuring that the memory of Karbala remains alive. And number two, the reason behind that is that Karbala is that single most powerful event that can inspire and motivate a person to seek for the truth and then to adhere or to abide by that path of truth. Which is why you will find millions of people, without an exaggeration on the word million, millions of people have found hidayah and inspiration to change their lives 180 degrees when they go to Karbala for the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein. You will find hundreds and thousands of people every year they decide to reform their lives through the barakat of the majalis of Imam al Hussein. You might find this even within your community. How many times you find a person was not religious to begin with, but by him participating in the majalis of Imam al Hussein, by him going for the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein, something clicks within his mind and he feels he needs to reform his life and take hold of this religion. Not only does he feel the need to adhere to the religion, but you find the level higher he feels the need to serve the religion and serve the cause of Imam al Hussein. Hence, you come back to yesterday's majlis, the quote or the hadith by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, <coughs> where he states, In al Hussein misbahu al huda wa safinatu al najat. The nature of the revolution of Imam al Hussein is such that the hearts of the people gravitate towards him, gravitate towards the values which he stood up for. Hence the importance of the tabligh and understanding Karbala. This is one. And then you find that in addition to the emphasis on performing the ziyarah as an act, you find that the Imams went forward and took great care in teaching the Shia on how to visit Imam al Hussein. Hence, you will find close to 25 different ziyaras, methodologies through which you can address Imam al Hussein. Subhanallah, the Imams have paid so much importance, particularly Imam al Baqir and as Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The mannerism and the etiquette through which you should address the master of the martyrs and the king of Jannah. And hence you find within the ziyarah, there is an etiquette through which you address Imam al-Hussein. 
Ziyarat Walitha, Ziyarat Ashura, the Ziyara when you go to Karbala and when you are in the Haram of Imam al Hussein, there are close to 20, 25 other Ziyaras. I recommend to myself, I advise myself and I advise you to read the book Kamilu Ziyarat. And you will find that this is one of the oldest books, a contemporary of Sheikh Al Mufid, the author. And you look at what he, the traditions that he has compiled in regards to the fada'il and the merits and the etiquettes when it comes to dealing and visiting Imam al Hussein. You find that the literature is a madrasa. For you find that within the ziyarah, the Imam teaches us how to address the Imam. This is one. But then, as we said a few nights back, the institution of ziyarah, the ziyarat of Imam al Hussein, in terms of the text, are a madrasa in its own, which gives us treasures and pearls of knowledge. You find, as we said a few nights back, Ziyarat Ashura. If a person contemplates over the meanings of Ziyarat Ashura, it helps build his personality, a personality of one which is a Muslim and a true follower and lover of Rasulullah and Islam and Allah. And similarly, you find within Ziyarat Ashura, within Ziyarat Waritha, you find that the Imam inside of Ziyaratul Waritha explains to us the values and the principles behind which Imam Al Hussein or the principles for which Imam Al Hussein sacrificed his life. The principles for which he stood up in Karbala are highlighted within Ziyarat Waritha. And from this, we address or we analyze this one part of the ziyarah where the sixth imam teaches us to address Imam al Hussein by saying, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat wa ataita zakat wa amarta bil ma'roof wa nahita anil munkar hatta ataka Allahu al yakin or hatta ataka al yakin. I bear witness that you establish the prayer and that you establish the zakat and amra bil ma'roof and nahi and il munkar until you met your lord you find within this statement the values behind the revolution of imam al hussein are outlined today our analysis is on this part of the phrase or this phrase of the ziyara ashhadu annaka akamta salat i bear witness I, I'm addressing who? Imam al Hussein. I bear witness that you, O Imam al Hussein, establish the prayer. What does this mean? This statement, this phrase in itself, has treasures of knowledge and wisdom within it. And a couple of years back, I spoke about this within a lecture. Ashadu Annaka Akamta Salat. But this year, insha'Allah, we shall add four different dimensions, four new dimensions in addition to what was discussed a few years back for us to get an inclusive understanding, a complete understanding of the implications of these words that you and I utter every day. And if we contemplate upon these words and understand their deeper meanings, you find that the next Thursday or the next time you stand up to recite Ziyaratul Waritha and you utter these phrases, it gives you a different level of Ma'rifa. Yesterday we said Awwaluddin Ma'rifatu. Everything begins with Ma'rifa. And you see now things begin to tie in with each other. The idea of reciting the Ziyara is to feel this essence within our hearts. Ala kullim. Fa, we say to the Imam, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat. I bear witness that you establish the prayer. What does it mean that I bear witness when we say Ashhadu annaka akamta salat? Now we begin by understanding the word Ashhadu. I bear witness that you, O Imam al Hussein, establish the prayer. What does this mean? Generally speaking, and particularly within the English language, when you say that I bear witness or I bear testimony, generally you bear testimony when, for example, in a court, when you are witness and you want to verify the claim of a third party, 
So you will say, I bear witness that Fulan, for example, is guilty. Or I bear witness that Fulan is not guilty. I bear witness that Fulan did X, Y, Z. I bear witness that Fulan did not do X, Y, Z. So usually when you say, I bear testimony or I bear witness, what you are trying to imply or what it implies is that I am testifying, I'm authenticating that this person did that action. You want to authenticate the claim of a person or discredit the claim of a person. If this is the understanding of bearing testimony, then I have to sit back and ask myself, who am I to even bear testimony that Imam al Hussein established the prayer? This is Sayyid Shabab Ahlil Jannah. He's the king of Jannah. A masum Imam, he does not need the testimony of a person like myself. Who am I, Aslan, to even have the audacity to say, I bear witness, Imam, you recited Salat. Who am I? Imam is the king of Jannah. Imam is the masum Imam who teaches other house to he teaches others how to pray. Subhanallah. How can I come and authenticate the claim? In fact, the contrary is true. The opposite is true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that the Ahlul Bayt are witness over our actions, not we being a witness over them. There is a hierarchy of authority where they are at the top and we are at the bottom. They are masters, we are slaves. The slave does not bear witness to the actions or testify to the authenticity of a master. It is the master that authenticates and bear witness on the slave. Ajib. So what happened over here? The opposite is true. The opposite in that the Imam is the one who bears witness over our actions. This is a great claim. On the day of judgment, Rasulullah and the Masum Imam are going to bear witness to our actions. Allahu Akbar. Sometimes people come forward and they say, This is a ghulu. What do you mean? On the day of judgment, accountability is in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only creator of the universe. How did we fit in the Imams? Do you find again, when we speak ideology, whatever we form, whatever perception we have about ideology, whatever opinion we hold about our faith system needs to be backed by proof, needs to be backed with the Burhan. Where is the proof for such a statement? Is there a claim within this, within the Quran and the Sunnah? Absolutely. You find that this concept is rooted within the Quran. Before we go to the hadith, you find in Surah to Tawbah, <coughs> Subhanallah, I may have messed up or um, confused within the uh, references uh, in regards to the particular verse. Or no, Alhamdulillah, wa shukar. Alhamdulillah. Verse number 105, Surah to Tawbah. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَكُلِ اعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ or وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَسَتَرُدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Tawbah verse number 105 says وَكُلْ Say who? Khitab is towards Rasulullah. O Rasulullah, say to the people, say to the people, اعملوا فسير الله عملكم ورسوله والمؤمنون Do whatever action you want, but know that your actions will be brought out in front of Allah. سير الله عملكم Yara to look at. Allah is not, well, ayadu billah does not have any physical features. No, these actions will be presented in front of Allah. Only to Allah, no, your deeds will be shown to Allah and will be brought forward in front of His Prophet wa Rasuluhu wal Mu'minun. Accountability at three levels. Your actions will be judged and portrayed in front of Allah. And will be, your actions will be brought forward in front of Rasulullah. 
and your actions will be brought forward in front of the mu'minun. Who are these mu'minun? A companion by the name of Buraid al-Ajali. And this tradition is found in Kitab Basairu darajat He comes to the sixth Imam al-Sadiq, he says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, our actions are going to be portrayed in front of Allah and the Prophet and the Mu'minun. Who are these Mu'minun? Imam al-Sadiq says, Iyana a'na. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to us, the Ulil Amr, who we described in the first few nights, as the Imams. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as the Mu'minun. He says that on the day of judgment, your actions shall be put forward in front of Allah, the Prophet, and the Imams. And they shall bear witness and bear testimony over every good act you and I have done. Which is why you find Imam as sadiq tells one of his companions by the name of Sama'a, Ma lakum tusi'una ala Rasulillah. The companion comes to Imam as sadiq and Imam as sadiq rebukes him. He says, what's wrong with you? That you bring sadness and you upset the Holy Prophet. Allah. He says, Wa kayfa yusi'unahu? He says, Ruhi lak al fida, or he said, Ju'il tu fidaq. Kayfa yusi'un? Rasulullah. May I be sacrificed for you? How do they upset the Holy Prophet? The Imam goes on to tell him, Do you not know that the actions that you perform? are then put forward and shown to Rasulullah and every bad action and every sin that you perform brings grief to the heart of Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. You find over here another door of ma'rifah opens forward in front of us and that you and I who claim to be lovers of Rasulullah, lovers of Ahlul Bayt, I should keep this in my mind and it helps me keep a check on my actions that every time I want to commit a sin, this sin which is recorded by the two angels on my shoulders, then is taken up to Rasulullah and Rasulullah looks at this. Today, Muhammad Abbas, this is the sin he committed and it brings grief to Rasulullah. Brings grief to our Imams. Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one side. Fear of punishment in Jahannam for committing sins on one side. I need to ask myself that if my scroll of deeds are filled with sins and these sins are going to be brought forward in front of the Imams, with what face am I going to face? With what face will I look at the Imam? With what dignity will I stand in front of Amirul Mu'mineen when my scroll of deeds are filled with sins and he's looking at them and looking at me? It's this concept known as sharam, haya, to feel shy, to feel ashamed. If you think about one sin that you have performed and you are really remorseful about it, that nobody knows except you, and then imagine if that dirty secret or that sin was to be exposed in front of those people who you love. With what face would you stand in front of them? Person die of grief, migrate, run away. Da? Now imagine that on the day of judgment in front of Imam al Hussein, in front of Amir al Mu'minin, in front of Rasul Allah. How do I commit a sin against that Lord who has given me all the ni'mas that I enjoy? With what face will I stand in front of him tomorrow? For you find that coming back to our topic, we love us with a hadith on this. This issue of our deeds reaching the Imams. A companion of Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad He comes to visit the Imam in Medina after completing the Hajj 
as soon as he enters the house and he performs the salam, Imam Masadiq says to him, O oh companion, O oh man, he takes the name of the companion, he says to him, if I'm not mistaken, Abu Basir. He says to him, O oh Abu Basir, I was informed of your deeds, this scroll of deeds which is recorded by the angels was brought to me. And I was filled with happiness because of an act of charity which you performed. Ya Rasulullah, which act of charity? He says, I saw in the scroll of deeds that before you went for Hajj, as you were leaving to perform the Hajj, when you were leaving your home, you took out from your wealth charity and you gave money to your relative who is not from within the same sect as us. In fact, he bears enmity towards us. But despite that, you did still a raham and you gave him an amount of money. He was financially struggling. You gave him this money. You helped him out. This still a raham. The action was noted by the malaika in your scroll of deeds. And I got to see this and this has brought happiness to me. This again opens another door of ma'rifah. Every action that you and I perform is within the knowledge of the imams. They are not in isolation or they are not veiled from the news and there were situations here. Every act that we do. Fayan subhanallah. Abu, one companion of the imam brings happiness to the heart of the imam by doing sila raham with somebody who bears enmity with the imam for imagine the happiness which is brought into the imam zaman of our time when he sees in the scroll of deeds that fulan fulan ali muhammad hassan came to a majlis to honor my madloom grandfather Abu abdullah al -Hussein. Scroll of deeds, Ahlul Bayt are fully aware of our actions and our service towards Ahlul Bayt. On it, this morning, I came across one of the events that happens in one of the lives within the autobiography of one of our scholars, Alama Mazandarani, Rahmatullah Alay, who died in Karbala close to maybe 60, 80 years ago. He says in his biography that I met with a companion of mine, Yani my colleague or my classmate within the Hausa who I used to study with, who then moved to Ihsa, Ihsa in Bahrain. He says my colleague on one of the nights in Shahrum Muharram, 9th of Muharram, he came to the Husayniya, was part of the majlis, participated in the grief and the aza and the matam and the service of the tabarruk. And he wept and cried so much. He says that night he went home to sleep few hours before Salatul Layl to recover because the next day being the day of Ashura. He says, while I was sleeping in my dream, I see that I am in a garden and there is a woman of great Jalala standing by the side of the garden weeping. Allahu Akbar. He says, I went closer. This woman who was fully veiled and nothing could be seen from her as if a shadow was standing in front of me. I ask, who is this woman? And he says, I heard the voice of the angel say that this is Fatima Zahra. Allah weeping for her son Hussein. The person says to Sayyidah Zahra, O daughter of Rasulullah, bear witness for me that I have spent my life weeping and serving your son Hussein. Sayyidah Zahra tells this person, I want you to convey a message on my behalf to the Shia, Allahu Akbar. This is a message from Sayyidah Fatima Taz Zahra to each and every one of us, each and every one of you. This madloom daughter of Rasulullah, whose baby was killed and her rib was crushed as she was crushed between the door and the wall, Allah. She gives a message and she says this to this Shaykh, Tell my Shia, 
for those who weep in the ma- who weep in the majalis for those who do latam latam yani matam for those who weep for those who perform the matam for those who attend for those who serve the food for those who ensure that the dhikr of my son continues tell them that on the day of judgment i fatima shall not enter jannah until i make sure each and every one of them and their families and their children enter jannah allahu akbar for do not take light these majalis that you attend do not take light this matam that you perform it's my brothers who were here a few nights back staying the entire night in the Imam Barga in the Husseiniya preparing flowers for the alam and the tabut these are actions that are recorded and then taken to Mawlatana Fatima Zahra to Imam Sahib Al-Amr and you bring happiness to it in his heart because you go through this pain and you have this eagerness to revive that revolution and keep that heat alive May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfill and accept all your hajat and give you tawfiq to serve Imam al Hussein for years to come until the duhur of the Imam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ala kulin. Coming back to our talk. For you find that when you say, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat, you are addressing Imam al Hussein and you say, I bear witness that you established the prayer. My testimony has no value. The testimony of the entire dunya has no value. Who are we to bear witness that Imam established the prayer? Imam is ma'asum Imam. On the contrary, as per the Quran and the Hadith, the Imam bears witness and bears testimony over our actions. He is the master and we are the slaves. If this is the case, then what does this statement mean? Ashadu annaka akamta salat. Therefore, when we come back to the grammar, when we come back to the linguists, what is meant over here when you say, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat, I bear witness that you establish the prayer. In reality, what it means is that you are very eloquently saying that I acknowledge, Ya Aba Abdullah Hil Hussein, that you establish the prayer within me. Acknowledge, Yani, I'm in a state of realization. This salat that we perform five times a day, these five prayers that are ordained upon us, I realize that you sacrificed your life, you gave your soul, you sacrificed the blood of your family members and companions and gave away everything in order to save this namaz. I realize that. Had it not been for your sacrifice, the salah that we pray today, the salah which the entire Muslim ummah prays today would not exist. Why? We have enough proof for this. Look at the poetry of Yazid ibn Muawiyah al-La'in. Again, when the severe head of Sayyidah Shuhada is brought to Sham, he looks at it and he says, La'ibat Hashim bil mulk. Fala khabarun, fala wahyun nazal, wala khabarun ja'a, o wala khabarun ja'a, wala wahyun nazal. La'anatullah on Yazid and his poetry. When he sees the severe head of Imam al Hussein being brought, and the family of Ahlul Bayt brought as prisoners. He looks in glee and he gloats. He says that Hashim Yani reference to Rasulullah. He says Rasulullah played with the Arab people to establish a government, to establish a kingdom. In reality, there was no revelation that came from Jibra'il. There was no deen. Everything was made up by Rasulullah, by Muhammad, in order to gain. A kingdom. The likes of Yazid were there to destroy the religion in its entirety. The difference between him and his father is that his father destroyed the religion block by block. And Yazid came to destroy it all at once. Both of them are equal in partners, not that one is less than the other. The son, after all, is the reflection of his father. But in any case, you find that. When you say, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat, I recognize Ya Aba Abdullah 
that this salat that we pray today, that me and the entire Muslim pray, ummah pray today, is because of your sacrifice. Hence, you find when a person comes and asks Imam Sajjad in Medina, he says, who won in the battle of Karbala? Was it Bani Umayyah or was it your father, Imam al Hussein? Imam Sajjad says to him, wait for the time of Salat. When you hear the Adhan, you will know who was victorious, my father or Bani Umayyah. For you find that the first meaning of this word, ash or this phrase, Ashadu annaka akamta salat, I recognize and I acknowledge, I am in a state of realization, awareness, yaqeen, that this salat would not have existed because of you. This is one, ma'rifa. The second dimension of understanding this word, ashhadu annaka, I bear witness, is an offshoot and the consequence of the first state. Now that you realize that this Salat would not exist had it not been for the sacrifice of Imam al Hussein, now that you realize and you acknowledge this, the next step is shukr, Allah. So when you say, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat, basically what you are saying to Imam al Hussein, I recognize that this salat has been preserved and I have the liberty to pray today because of you. And number two, now I am thankful for, I am thankful to you for allowing me and for preserving this institution of salat which I perform on a daily basis. Allah. Hence you find. Close to a hundred years back, one of our maraja, may Allah bless his soul, when he used to be the Imam al Jama'a in Karbala al Muqaddas, in the Sahan of Imam al Hussein, after the Adhan was given and the, he recited the Iqama, before he did the Takbiratul Ahram, he would say, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. People would come to him and say, Why is it before Takbiratul Ahram you're saying, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah? He said, It is because of this Aba Abdullah that the Salat exists today that you and I recite. And then from here you see how the relationship changes. Your relationship with Imam al Hussein changes. In that if you have the habit of reciting Salat and you appreciate Salat, you find that you appreciate Imam al Hussein more. Now you begin to understand the sacrifice of Imam al Hussein. You were thanking him for that salat because you yourself pray salat. But if you don't even pray salat to begin with, then you didn't recognize, you didn't appreciate this aspect of the revolution of Imam al Hussein. And therefore, I find there's a disconnect between me and Imam Hussein. But the more I pray, and I realized that the Salat is the Mi'raj of a Mu'min as per the Hadith. As Salat Mi'rajul Mu'min. I, as I pray and I feel that my soul is being elevated through this prayer and I am able to seek proximity to Allah through this prayer, I become more and more grateful towards Imam al Hussein and I say, Thank you, Ya Imam. I know the value of this salat which you saved. Hence, you find as soon as you finish reciting Ziyarat al Waritha or Ziyarat Ashura, recommended that you recite two rakat salat for Imam al Hussein. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ya Ali. Therefore, you find that when you say, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat, basically, I attest, yani I recognize Ya Abu Abdullah al Hussein, this Salat would not be present today had it not been for you. And number two, I am grateful because I prayed the Salah, I know the value of the Salah, and you saved this Salah, so I thank you for that. You see, it is an ilaka or a connection of shukr. This is in regards to the phrase Ashhadu Annaka. Ashhadu from the phrase or the word Ashhadu from the phrase Ashhadu Annaka Akamta Salat. Tayyib. Moving on, what does it mean Akamta Salat? I bear witness that you establish the prayer. The words of the Imams are absolutely precise. We don't say Adayta Salat. There is a difference between Ada'u Salat and Ikamatu Salat. Ada'u Salat means observe the prayer. So if you would have said, Ashhadu Annaka Adayta Salat, 
It would mean I bear witness that you observed the prayer. To observe the prayer means to perform the prayer in the form that it was revealed to us in terms of qiyam, sajdatain, ruku, tashahud, those acts which are rukun and those acts that are gayr rukun, reciting salat on time, for example. This comes under observing the prayer, ada'us salat. We're not talking about ada'us salat. For Imam al Hussein, we're saying, ashhadu annaka akamta salat. You established the prayer. Now we understand that there is a deep relationship between salat and the revolution of Imam al Hussein. Coming back to the question, what does it mean that you established the Salat? There is something much deeper than observing the Salat as an action on five given times during the day. No, this is something much deeper. How? As an introduction, you have the hadith from Rasulullah where he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Where he says, As salatu amudu din. Salat is the central pillar of the religion. Amud, like the amud is the central pole of a tent. In that, if you were to remove that pole, the entire tent would come crashing down. For Rasulullah says, As salat amudu din. The prayer, the salat is the central pillar of the religion. If you were to take away the salat, the entire deen would come crashing down. This is what it means. As salat amudu deen. The prayer is the central pillar of religion. If you take away the salat, the entire deen comes crashing down. And in Ziyanat al Waritha, we are saying, Ashadu annaka akamta salat. I bear witness that you establish the prayer. And the prayer is the central pillar of the deen, meaning that if you destroy the salat, the entire deen is destroyed. And if you establish the salat, the entire deen is established. So, in essence, what what you were saying is, oh Imam al Hussein, I bear witness that you established the entire deen. This is what Karbala was. Imam al Hussein stood up for the entire deen. Now we see that there is a relationship between deen and salat. As salat amudu deen. Salat is the central pillar of the religion. So long as salat is established, deen is established, salat is destroyed, the entire deen is destroyed. From here we understand that salat as an action contains values that represent the entire deen. Salat is an institution which embeds or summarizes the values of the entire deen. Yani in other words, the values and the principles that govern the entire deen are summarized within Islam, within Salat. And Imam al Hussein established that Salat. Meaning what? Meaning when you say, I bear witness you establish Salat, Ya Ani, Ya Aba Abdullah Al Hussein, I recognize and I attest to the fact that you are the personification of all the values which are embedded in Salat, which in turn are a representation of the entire deen. Allahu Akbar. Salat as an action should not be viewed just as an action, as a ritual. La. Ya subhanallah, now you find that your understanding of Salat changes 180 degrees. The values that are contained within Salat are a representation of the entire deen. And Imam al Hussein was a personification of these values. How? You find that in Salat, see, Salat as an action, the result of Salat, the result and result of performing Salat is that it needs to have a tangible effect on your character. The values that are contained inside Salat then need to be 
shown or exhibited within your character and within your actions. Otherwise that Salat has no use, has no benefit. For example, you find in Khutbah Fadakiya of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra salawatullahi wa salam hu alayha Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When she's talking in her khutbah, I recommend again myself and you to read this khutbah in depth and to ponder upon these words. In a part of a khutbah, she's talking about the philosophy behind some of the actions which are established in the religion. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala impose upon us salat? Why did he make it obligatory? Sayyidah Zahra explains in the khutbah, when she says, Ja'alallahu al-salat tanzi'an lakum anil kibra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained upon us the prayer in order to clean our souls from arrogance. Ya subhanallah. This in itself is a majlis on its own. What is the correlation between salat and arrogance? But at the same time it is also a measure. If I find inside me the character of arrogance, I know there is something wrong in my salat. My salat is not being accepted. Something cut clear, so the Zahra makes clear within her khutbah. That's something else. So you find that Salat as an action has values that are embodied within it. And Imam al Hussein is the personification of these values. Like what? For example, we'll take three quick examples insha'Allah. The first example is that in Salat, you recite Surah Al-Hamd. Your Salat cannot be valid. Fajr. Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Aisha cannot be valid unless you recite Surah Al-Hamd. Surah Al-Hamd is an obligatory requirement within the Salat. You find that Furada, obviously when you're reciting Jama'ah, you are silent and following the Imam. This Any case, Surah Al-Hamd to be recited. Salat becomes batil if you didn't recite Surah Al-Hamd on purpose. Within Surah Al-Hamd, you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm al-Din, Iyaka na'abudu wa Iyaka nasta'een. You say Iyaka na'abudu. What does it mean? Sometimes we need to contemplate over what we are reciting inside of Salat. Or is it just a recitation like the recitation of a parrot? <laughs> La. Has to, we have to contemplate, I'm speaking to my Lord, what am I saying to him? More important than that, what am I saying to him? One thing, am I loyal and truthful in what I'm saying to my Lord? Something very great. Otherwise I become a liar if I don't mean what I say. For in Surah Al-Hamd we say, Iyaka na'abudu. Ya Allah, you and only you exclusively do I worship. When I utter these words in Salat, is my life a reflection of these values or no? In my life outside of Salat, in my actions, in my interactions, do I submit to the rule of Allah or do I submit to my desires? Am I a slave of the Lord of the universe or am I a slave of my desires? When the time of Salah comes in, when the time of Salah sets in, do I respond to the call of my creator as a loyal slave who submits to his commands or do I submit to my desires? The football comes first, the NFL comes first, everything else comes first, then comes the Salah. My job comes first, then comes the Salah. Do I submit to my desires and my luxury or am I submitting to Allah? You, you find that the personification of this one verse of the Quran, this one verse within the Salat, there is nobody on the face of this earth who could personify this verse better than Imam al Hussein. Because you find. That on the day of Ashura, in the heat of the battle, at the time of Zawal, Imam al Hussein puts down his sword and recites Salat. Sometimes ponder over this. And she ajib jiddan. You are in a battlefield surrounded by 70,000 bloodthirsty people. To leave your sword 
hungry, thirsty. Leave that. Ya Aba Abdullah, your children and your women are wailing and weeping. If you are in a state of salat, you could compromise their security. They could be attacked while you were praying. You find Imam Al Hussein without a care, without a thought. The war and his life on one side. The security of his women and his children on one side. He directs his attention towards the Lord of the universe. Takbiratul Ahram. Allahu Akbar. No one greater than Allah. This is the personification of the verse. Iyaka na'budu. You alone do I worship. If I want to learn how to worship Allah, look at Imam al Hussein. He is the embodiment of this salat that we are praying. His life was the embodiment of the values within this salat. Now I see, ya subhanallah, my understanding of salat has changed. Now I need to ask myself, all these prayers that I've been praying in the last 20, 30, 40 years, have they been accepted, Lola? Am I truthful when I say, Iyaka na'budu? Or is it Allah is saying, this slave is another liar coming to utter a lie five times a day shamelessly? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, arhamur rahimin. No one is perfect, bila shak. These are the nights for forgiveness. But once we learn this, we educate ourselves, we find that salat is an institution which is much more deeper than a set of ritualistic actions that we just need to finish, get out of the way and continue with the rest of the day. La, it has to have a character. The salah has to have an impact on my life, on my behavior. Not for just any simple reason. Rasulullah said, salat amudu deen. This is one, Iyaka na'budu. Wa Iyaka nasta'een. Rasulullah, Iyaka nasta'een, yani I do not rely upon anybody. I do not have hope in anybody. I do not require or I am not needy of anyone except you, Ya Allah. The first resort is Allah in every type of difficulty, even in times of goodness and comfort. My first point of return is you, Ya Allah. I have any complaint, that complaint is not to the people, it's to you, Ya Allah. I have shukr, that first shukr is to you, Ya Allah. Aun, tawakkul, trust in Allah. Everything, first point of return is Allah. You find Imam al Hussein's life was a manifestation of this verse. Find on the day of Ashura, before the battle starts, they are under siege three days. No water, no food, nothing. Surrounded people ready to kill him. What does Imam al Hussein do after Salatul Fajr? He recites dua. Read the dua which Imam al Hussein reads on the day of Ashura. After everything that has happened, he says to Allah, Ya Allah. How many trials and tribulations that fell upon me, you saved me from them. Ajib. Similarly, Sayyidah Zainab al Kubra, she comes into the courtyard of Ibn Ziyad al Lain. Her entire family has been massacred. When she begins her khutbah, what does she begin with? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. To send hamd. And to thank Allah despite all this, Ma'rifa. Understanding of Allah is different. He knows that first point of return, we do not seek help or assistance or rely on anyone except the Lord of the universe. And there is a whole understanding between tawakkul and tawakkul. But this is perhaps for another time. For you find in short, that Imam al Hussein's life was a personification of the values that are embedded within Salat, which is what you mean when you say, Ashhadu annaka akamta salat, ya ani ya aba abdullah, I acknowledge and I realize that you were a personification of all the values embedded in Salat and the values which are embedded in Salat are an expression of the deen in its entirety. 
This iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'een, which we recite in salat, means what? You only do we worship and you upon and you only exclusively do we rely on. Fundamental of Tawheed. Surah Al Hamd is actually very interesting. Surah Al Hamd is the summary of the entire Quran. Our entire Usuluddin is found inside of Surah Al Hamd. It's a tafsir of Surah Al Hamd. Another example. Salatul Jama'a. Salatul Jama'a is an institution where the mu'mineen and the mu'minat get together to worship Allah in congregation and the philosophy behind that is that the mu'mineen, the believing men will stand shoulder to shoulder. The believing women will stand shoulder to shoulder regardless of their color, regardless of their social status, regardless of their income, regardless of every other secondary man-made division. Regardless, man will stand shoulder to shoulder. Salatul Jama'a is supposed to foster within us the culture of equality between men, dealing with equality between men. <laughs> the person who attends Salatul Jama'a every day participates in Jama'a but is racist in his behavior, has not understood the first thing about Salatul Jama'a. Then I need to come back and I need to question myself. 40, 30, 20 years of Salatul Jama'a, I've been praying, what have I learned from this Jama'a? Salat holds values which should then be represented in my action. Salatul Jama'a, equality. You find Imam al Hussein was the manifestation of equality, which is supposed to be taught to us in Salatul Jama'a. Why? You find that on the day of Ashura, when his companion by the name of Joan, the servant of Abu Dhar al Ghaffari, who was from Habasha, Abyssinia, when he was killed in the battlefield, Imam al Hussein comes. He puts his head on the, he puts the head of Joan on his lap. He cleans his blood and the sand from his face. Imam al Hussein puts his cheek on the cheek of Joan and weeps for him. A, 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 a servant of Abu Dhar who has come from Abyssinia, darker in color than Imam al Hussein, and you find Imam al Hussein does the same action with Ali al Akbar, his own son. When Ali al Akbar falls down, Imam al Hussein takes his head, puts it on his lamb, and wipes the sand and the blood from his face and puts his cheek on his cheek. Equality in dealing. Now we need to ask ourselves, did we truly understand Salah in the way Islam wants us to understand Salah? The Salat that we perform, is it the Salat which is acceptable by Allah? It's the biggest thing that I want you to take from here is that Salat is not supposed to be any ritualistic action that we just get over and done with. Abadan la. It contains values, it contains principles, and these values and principles are reflected in every verse of the Quran which we recite within Salat. And then we need to come out and implement them in our lives. Hence, you find the greatness of this statement, Ashhadu Annaka Akamta Salat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Traditionally, the night such as this, we recount the masa'ib of the children of Sayyidah Zainab al Kubra, Aun and Muhammad. However, insha'Allah, Mawlana in Urdu will do the masaib of Aun and Muhammad. And therefore, I want to recite the masaib of another youth from the youth of Ahlul Bayt who is not remembered that often. But he has a big right and haq over us. 
and this is Abdullah the son of Muslim bin Akil. His death on Karbala was one of the most painful deaths that any of the Ashab faced. Muslim bin Akil, the companion, the ambassador of Imam al Hussein, had seven sons. Five of these sons were killed in Karbala. Two of them, who are more commonly known as Tiflan Muslim bin Akil, were captured in a prison in Kufa for one year. And after being imprisoned for a whole year, they escaped. As they escaped, they were caught in an entire narration that has detail. These two children, who were not older than seven or nine, were then beheaded by the Forat and their headless bodies thrown into the river Forat. This is in Kufa. They are buried where? Musayya bin Karbala. Only Allah knows for how many days their bodies, headless bodies, floated in the river Forat to be buried where they are today. Muslim bin Akil Madloom, ambassador who was betrayed by his people in Kufa. The narrations tell us that when Muslim was captured, he was taken to the highest point, to the rooftop of Darul Imara. They beheaded him and then threw his body down from the top. The narrator mentions in, his po in a poem, in a poet, the narrator mentions, only God knows how many bones were broken in the body of Muslim when they threw him down from the rooftop. Allah, Allah. The narration mentions that this Muslim bin Akil's five children who were there in Karbala, the narration mentions the moment had come on the point on the day of Ashura where all the companions of Imam al Hussein had been martyred. After Salat al Dhuhr, no one remained in the camp except the youth of Bani Hashim. From amongst the youth of Bani Hashim were the children of Muslim bin Akil. The eldest son of Muslim bin Akil was by the name of Abdullah. He came to seek permission from Imam al Hussein. He says to him, O oh Master, Aba Abdullah, do you give me permission to fight in the battlefield? Imam al Hussein looked towards Abdullah and he said to him, O oh my dear child, your mother, his mother was Sayyida Rukayya, the half sister of Imam al Hussein. She was married to Muslim bin Akil. Imam al Hussein says to Abdullah, O oh Abdullah, your mother is grieving from the loss of her husband. Allah, Allah, Muslim who has just been killed less than a month back, your mother is still grieving, and perhaps she will not be able to bear the grief of her son being also killed. So Imam al Hussein said to Abdullah, the son of Muslim bin Akil, Why don't you take your mother and why don't you take your younger siblings and escape through the values at this point Abdullah ibn Muslim bin Akil looks at Imam al Hussein and he says to him that I shall never choose this dunya which is temporary over the akhirah which is eternal indeed I shall never abandon my master do you give permission for this soul to be sacrificed on your behalf Allah when Imam al Hussein saw that Abdullah ibn Muslim bin Akil is absolutely determined to give his life with tears pouring down the cheeks of Imam al Hussein. He hugged Abdullah ibn Muslim bin Akil for a last time. He looked at him and he bade him farewell. Abdullah went and bare his mother farewell, Sayyidah Rukayya. The poet says it is as if Sayyidah Rukayya tells Abdullah, When you meet your father, Muslim in heaven, give him my salams. Allah, Allah. Abdullah ibn Muslim bin Akil then walked out into the battlefield with his sword the narration mentions he recited the poem saying today I shall meet my father Muslim indeed we are the youth of Akil we are the youth of Bani Hashim the people of honor and glory who were never known to be deviant indeed we are the people of Bani Hashim the best of lineages and the best of people the narration mentions that Abdullah the son of Muslim bin Akil went into 
enter the battlefield. Despite being hungry and thirsty for three days, he attacked the army in three separate attacks, killing 98 people from the enemies. When, he re when they retreated and he stood alone in the battlefield, they decided to attack him from every direction. Allah, Allah, the narration mentions that as they attacked him, Abdullah began to defend himself from every direction and that if he would keep away the enemies from the front the enemies would attack him from the back if he would defend himself from the back they would come to attack him from the front at this point one of the enemies by the name of Amr ibn Sa'dawi he shoots an arrow towards the face of Abdullah the son of Muslim bin Akil the narration mentions because he shot an arrow towards the face of Abdullah from such a close range as the arrow was coming towards his face Abdullah tried to protect his face with his hand but because of the intensity with which the arrow was shot from such a close distance the narration mentions that the arrow pierced the palm of Abdullah came out from the other side and penetrated the forehead of Abdullah ibn Muslim bin Akil the narration says or fasamarahu wa thabatat kaffahu ila jabhati the palm of Abdullah became stuck to his forehead because of the arrow while he was in this state the same enemy Amr came and he shot an arrow from close distance towards the chest of Abdullah the narration mentions the arrow planted implanted into his chest ripping open the heart of Abdullah he fell down from his horse as he fell down he started taking his last breaths and he said oh Allah be, be little and humiliate the community that has humiliated us as soon as he uttered these words the enemy took a spear he stood over the chest of Abdullah and he planted it into his chest. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa la'adatullahi ala a'da'a li Muhammad min al-awwalina wa l-akhirin ila qiyami yawmiddin matamih husayn.